Rafat al arir a well-known Palestinian writer, poet and professor of English literature, has been killed by the IDF. He died along with his sister, his brother-in-law and their children in an airstrike in the northern Gazan house where they were living. Rafat had been a widely followed commentator speaking from within Gaza throughout the war. This is footage of him on a live stream two months ago. We know that it's very bleak, it's very dark. Uh, there's no way out. Uh, if, if there's no water, there is no uh, way out of Gaza. W- what should we do? Like drown? Like commit mass suicide? Is this what Israel wants? And we're not going to do that. And I was telling some somebody, some friend the other day that I am an academic. I probably the toughest thing I have at, at home is an expo marker. But if the Israelis invade, if they charge at us, charge at us, open door to door to massacre us, I'm going to use that marker, throw it at the Israeli soldiers, even if that is the last thing that I would be able to do. And this is the feeling of everybody. We are helpless. We have nothing to lose. Rafat dedicated his life to teaching and to documenting the Palestinian experience, especially in Gaza, where he lived. This is part of a piece he wrote about his childhood there called Gaza Asks, When Shall This Pass? So he writes, As I grew into a proud stone thrower at the age of 12, the thing I feared most was my dad's wrath. He worked in Israel as a laborer, and if he had caught me throwing stones, he would have rebuked me. My dad was not heartless or abusive. He just knew that if the Israeli forces had caught me, he would have lost his work permit. I survived the first intifadas, that's 1987 to 93, in which Israel killed over 1,600 Palestinians and injured thousands. I was lucky I escaped Israel's bullets and Yitzhak Rabin's broken bones policy. That was not true of my friend Liwa Bakrun, then 13, who was chased by an Israeli settler who shot him dead from point-blank rage in front of his classmates. The Israeli settler did not want to punish Liva for throwing stones, for Lewa did not throw stones. The settler wanted to teach those who threw stones a lesson by killing a kid in front of the eyes of scores of little scared kids going back home from school and a few meters away from Lua's home. His mother's shrieks still ring in my ears. More recently, Rafat wrote this poem. It was posted to his Twitter seven days before he was killed. If I must die, let it be a tale, it's called. If I must die, you must live to tell my story, to sell my things, to buy a piece of cloth and some strings, make it white with a long tail, so that a child somewhere in Gaza, while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad who left in a blaze and bid no one farewell, not even to his flesh, not even to himself, sees the kite, my kite you made, flying up above, and thinks for a moment an angel is there bringing back love. If I must die, let it bring hope, let it be a tale. Now, that poem has been read millions of times, I think, today on social media. Haymarket Books is giving the volume of Palestinian writing containing the first piece um, I showed you away for free if you want to read more. It's called Light in Gaza. Now, you might be wondering why we're just focusing on one person who now lies dead amongst more than 17,000 other Palestinians killed in Gaza. Every one of those deaths is, of course, a tragedy. And the number killed in such a short time does indicate to many the genocidal nature of this war. But genocide isn't just about killing a group of people. It's also about erasing their culture, their history and their art, as well as the people who make that culture and disseminate it. After all, settler colonialism gets difficult when there are too many reminders of the humanity of the people you're ethnically cleansing. Artists, poets and writers like Rafat get in the way of that, as do the places they work in and the institutions they build. Rafat taught at the Islamic University of Gaza. It was destroyed in an Israeli air raid on October the 11th, a fact that was only made clear during the week-long truce at the end of November. Also targeted by Israel was the Mekdad Printing Press and Library, amongst the oldest in Gaza. In late November, Mekdad posted this, A dream and 30 years of effort. They burned it and ended it. Mekdad Printing Press and Library, one of the oldest printing presses in Gaza. The Israeli bombing led to its complete end. Millions in losses as a result of the bombing and burning of printing machines, equipment, books and supplies. My whole family, my mother, father and brothers have a hand in this effort. They finished it in an instant. My father went back to pre-zero. 
Then there are the libraries. Gaza's central archive and library was also bombed by Israel. Thousands of historical documents are thought to have been destroyed in the bombardment. The archive contained handwritten material from important figures in Palestinian history, as well as land deeds and building designs, some over 100 years old. Bissan Auda, a journalist based in Gaza, posted her reaction to that destruction on Instagram. Today, Gaza municipality said that the Israeli war plans bombed and destroyed the central archive building that contained thousands of documents uh, aged more than 100 years. Yani, they, they know actually what, what they are bombing. They do this intentionally. And now literally, we don't have anything. The future is unknown, the present is destroyed, and the past is not is no longer our past. We don't know now anything about our city. And I used to make Hakawatiye, the storyteller program, and I used to talk in dozens of episodes about Gaza and the history of Gaza. And if we think about Gaza, and now they destroyed this place. Oh my God, how 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 evil are they? How monsters are they? I, I, are them? I, I, yani, can, can you imagine that they are doing all these things to destroy the depth of us. Yani, gahar. What does it mean, gahar? Gahar is to make someone so sad. I don't know what does it mean in English. I don't know. But they're trying to gahar us. I don't know. They're destroying our, our, our city, our lives forever. Like forever. Just this. And by the way, today is the 29th of, of, of November. It's the international day to solidate with, uh, of solidarity to, with, with the Palestinian people. And we're under, uh, under bombing. The last day of the truce. It's not extended anymore. Incredible day. Since sharing that video, Bissan Alda has said that her house has been bombed. She posted a photo on Instagram with this message. This is me and my cats in my home in Gaza City. The home was bombed and destroyed yesterday. I don't know where are my free kittens in Gaza City is destroyed. This is our lives in Gaza Strip right now, a non-stop nightmare. We lost everything. According to reports, Gaza's main public library lies in ruins too. Now, you may not know this, but any book shipped to Gaza has to pass through Israel first. Post can be halted at any time, parcels withheld. So it's not easy to build a library when you're under occupation. Monuments to historical figures have also been destroyed. In Janine, in the occupied West Bank, a shrine was erected in honor of Palestinian-American journalist Shireen Abu Akla, murdered by an IDF gunman. This is what's left of it after an IDF operation early in the morning of October the 26th. The International Federation of Journalists has called on the International Criminal Court to investigate Abu Akla's murder. Also in the West Bank, this happened. So on November the 14th, an Israeli bulldozer destroyed the statue erected in memory of the founder of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, Yasser Arafat, in Tulkam. That's the Palestinian leader who signed the historic 1995 Oslo Accords, agreeing to a two-state solution and self-determination for the Palestinians. Just rubble now. Cultural property, libraries, archives... Monuments are protected under the 1954 Hague Convention, and according to the ICC, willful attacks on cultural heritage are a criminal violation of the Rome Statute, prosecutable in the International Criminal Court. Of course, though, Israel, like the United States, is not a member of that organization. Now, there has, over the past 24 hours, been an enormous outpouring of mourning for Rafit al arir but not everyone is joining in. Quote tweeting one writer's message about um, Rafiq, the editor of the Jewish Chronicle, posted this screenshot. So you've got Adam Horowitz there sort of talking um, about the death of Rafat. And then you have Jake Wallace Simons, who seems to be doing a sort of gotcha where he's quote tweeting a tweet from Rafat, which says, with or without baking powder in reference to a story about a baby found in an oven. Now, this has gone viral on Twitter today as sort of evidence that Rafat thinks it's funny that babies are put in ovens. But clearly that's actually a joke because the story wasn't true. We know it wasn't true. We've talked about this on previous shows. There was one baby that was killed on October the 7th. One baby dying is a tragedy enough, but there was no babies in ovens. This story was not true. So he was mocking a fake story, not celebrating the death of a baby. And everyone using this as a gotcha on the day or the day after he's died, I find 
pretty repulsive. Um, Omar, I want to ask you about sort of the significance of of the death of this or the killing of this distinguished poet. I did not have uh, the honor of actually knowing him directly, but we do know each other exclusively on social media uh, from following each other and retweeting each other and, and, and so on. And there's no question that he was uh, an invaluable voice, that he's connected to many people here in the United States. Endless friends who have family in Gaza have actually met with him personally, uh, describe him as a teacher, and his contributions in terms of shedding light and the power of his words and his poetry um, he is incredibly significant, and his killing is essentially an extension of a long campaign, as you mentioned, of Israel trying to wipe out every expression of Palestinian identity that resonates with the outside world. And it's part of the project that began, frankly, in 1948 and never stopped. When Israel was created as a state, uh, there was this mythology of a land without a people for a people without a land. And in order to make that a reality, in spite of Israel driving out more than 700,000 Palestinians out of their homes at the time to create a Jewish state and committing many, many massacres, is the literal erasure of hundreds of Palestinian towns and villages, about 600 of them, um, in order to obliterate any record of the fact that Palestinians existed in this place before, we know how the story ends. We know that if Israel is allowed to continue down that path, it will not be very different from what happened in a place like the United States to Native Americans, where they are now confined to small reservations, um, where there are many museums commemorating the atrocities committed against them. But we have an opportunity for an intervention before that happens in Palestine and Israel right now. We have an opportunity to stop this ongoing genocide, to stop the erasure of the indigenous population in Palestine. And that requires us to act with the kind of courage that we pretend we would have had with historical events. We talk about earlier genocides in the world. We talk about slavery. We talk about colonialism. We talk about so many things as if, oh, yes, that was a shameful part of history. If it were, if it were to happen again, of course, we would act differently. We would, we would raise our voices. Well, it is unfolding right now as we speak. We have an unbearable just, injustice being imposed on Palestinians, denying them their freedom, and basically saying, if you try to resist a life without freedom, then we're going to obliterate you from existence. And we're watching that unfolding as we speak. It really is an opportunity to intervene. This is a where were you moment in history. And we should be able to tell future generations that when this moment came, we raised our voices and did absolutely everything we could to stop an unspeakable atrocity from being committed against Palestinians. And frankly, even if you don't care about Palestinians and only care about the security and freedom of Israelis, We've seen that this path of trying to pummel Palestinians into submission has led to nothing but more and more violence. And even if you're just concerned about Israeli safety, that also should be adequate motivation for you to be fighting for a just solution in which Palestinians get to live free and exist with human rights on their own land, because that is ultimately the only way we're going to achieve a better future for both Israelis and Palestinians. Palestinians have to be free and we have to demand it.